Resolution Foundation uh, to be on for that event as well. Um, thanks for coming this morning. And thanks for bearing with us. I think the Minister will be here uh, imminently. I'm sorry, unless he's got lots of food questions to there. And he obviously done that there. Um, this is a really important uh, report for us. I guess I would say that all the reports, but this feels so close to the bone uh, for me personally and I think for the organisation. We do a lot of stuff on low pay, on property wages, um, and we've made quite a lot of giving a lot of focus to the care sector over recent years. And in part, that I've got sort of a personal interest in it, which has motivated me a bit. Uh, some years ago, a close relative of mine uh, was complaining to me time and again about how little they got paid. They were a care worker. Um, and I remember saying that, eventually I said to myself, this just can't be right, because if what you're saying is true, you would be getting paid significantly less than the minimum wage. Um, and that can't be happening. How many money was that then? Um, so we went through her pay slips together and it transpired she that was exactly what was happening. She was getting paid uh, a lot less than the minimum wage. <coughs> and that's when I started to get quite fired up about this issue. Indeed, about exactly that same time, I had to organise a lot of care for my, for my dad. And I remember interviewing a whole bunch of providers, uh, asking all sorts of questions. So one of them was, how do you ensure that your workforce receives the minimum wage? Um, and the answers I got back was going to reveal it. Some of them which are very brazen, people just sort of stood at you in the eye and said the minimum wage just doesn't apply to this part of the workforce. So that's one sort of response I got. Another one which was kind of more just patronising, I suppose, rather than brazen, was just it's really complicated and we don't get into that applies, it's just confusing people. Um, of course, other people uh, I spoke to were brilliant, uh, lived up with their workers very well, and indeed they did lived up with my dad very well. So, the bad stories don't apply to everyone. There's, there's fantastic care out there too, but let's not forget there are lots of bad stories. Um, that was all a few years ago, and in some ways, things have moved on quite far, in some ways, uh, since then, in that I think the extent of denial <coughs> about the problem vis-a-vis this workforce has been reduced. Actually, I think Norman, uh, I'll say this before, I'll say this blushes, I think Norman's made a wrong one. I think he's actually given voice to some of the concerns. So I think the, the, the public debate has improved. The scale of the underlying problem, the scale of non compliance of minimum wage, and perverse, pervasive extent of low pay hasn't gone away. If anything, it's got worse. So I think in some regards things have moved on, in some regards they haven't moved on um, at all. So I suppose that what we wanted to do in this report, and you'll be doing more about it from Laura in a minute, she's done all the hard work, um, is, to, is to not just be defensive and doing what we've done in the past by campaigning for people get paid the minimum wage, which of course is absolutely vital, but actually to sort of cast forward a fair bit and to say, what should we be aiming for? Uh, where could we get to over the course of the poll in terms of this workforce, which we know is the worst paid, the most overlooked and undervalued workforce, I think, in this country. Um, and we don't expect all of the things we're going to propose, which you'll hear about in a minute, to, to happen overnight. We're not naive when it comes to the fiscal situation of this country. Uh, but we also refuse to be pessimists about the capacity for change in relation to this workforce, which is so crucial to so many of us uh, in terms of what it means, in terms of the work they do, what it means for our families. Um, so anyway, we're delighted to be uh, having this debate. We're delighted with the panel we've got. We're delighted, we'll be extra delighted when the minister actually arrives. <laughs> um, and I'm finally up for me. I'm really delighted that you've got um, Tony Cavendish here, who is, is really the ideal person to be overseen today, if you don't know, you probably do know, if you don't know, apart from the English station, and so I think that's quite nice on Sunday Times, Miller has, has written often and, and brilliantly and very sort of passionately about care, the state of care in this country, and she led a very uh, important review into the care and the health workforce um, not that long ago, so we are in good hands this morning. Uh, and with that, I shall pass over to you. Thank you very much, Um I'm going to just say a few things, and I'm really hoping that Prince will arrive by the time Laura puts up the slides. I think that's the key moment for him to see what Laura is saying. Um, we've got a really great panel, um, and the way we're going to organise it is that Laura Gardner here, the great report, will do analysis for you. Norman um, is late and will have to leave, I understand, at about uh, quarter to 11. We'll then respond, and then we can open it up, because I can see a lot of expertise in this room, and I think it's really to get to many people as far as possible. Um, then we're going to move to David Pearson, who many people know, who's president of ADAS, and then we're going to move to Heather Wakefield, who's head of the government of peace and justice at Unison, who obviously done a huge amount of work on this area as well. 
I can really use one again. So hopefully we can get some more um, good today. Um, just in terms of my own uh, view of this, I mean, I when I first saw the title of this debate, I did think, oh, you know, because we've all been stuck in that minimum wage debate for so long, and it's so desperate. And you, the Assembly of the Foundation, have both done really good work on showing just how many are still not being paid the minimum wage, which is an absolute average in this country. So I was sort of stuck in that end of the debate, and suddenly I see the living wage um, coming onto the horizon. I think that's actually a really good way of trying to move this debate forward. And I think you do too, because I'm sure most of you have been stuck in this minimum wage debate, and neither of you was, I think, 18 months ago. I, you know, so I was at the but many of you were in this debate many, for many years before that. Um, I suppose what I feel is that there's still, we still haven't got a sufficient understanding in our society of the importance of this work. Um, what really struck me, I did a lot of focus groups with frontline workers, and I was able to meet, through you and others, a huge amount, a number of people who work in the centre, especially in domiciliary care, which I think is probably the most difficult in this country. And what really struck me was that we talk so often about basic care. As if somehow going into the house of a stranger on your own and making an assessment of somebody's needs and building a relationship with that person and often building relationships with people who are very difficult to build relationships with, people with dementia, children with learning disabilities, all, all the groups that we know about. Those are incredibly skilled tasks and it just seems to me that some of the language that's been used in this debate in the past doesn't really fit the reality. And as we all know, of course, uh, the social care workforce is having to take on more and more responsibilities, more and more complex tasks, more and more challenges. And again, um, one of the things that struck me was that a huge amount of the most pioneering and innovative work is actually going on in social care. And the NHS has learned a lot from that, because a lot of the people I've also been with work in the NHS work is particularly difficult challenges. But sometimes those people are working at least in a supervised structure. Social care, you're very often not, and you're very often having to make split second decisions on your own. And I think we haven't quite got the rest of society to understand that yet. Especially because I suspect that if you don't have an elderly relative or you haven't got a child with elderly disability, so you haven't necessarily come across this phenomenal group of people. The other thing that really struck me was that job satisfaction among this group very much comes from being able to build relationships with people. That's what so many people tell me. And very often when they give up, it is partly because they can't get paid for travel time, they literally can't make it work for themselves financially. It can also be because they just can't give the level of people they want to give. And there's quite a lot of academic research on the psychological effects on people who have a vocation to care not having enough time to care and are not actually having the infrastructure that's needed. So again, I think, you know, we've got stuck in this whole area of 15 minute visits and so on. Um, the reality, as many of you know, is we end up with huge attrition rates in this country. We end up with people who just can't take any more and they think that some of the best people are the best part of the people who can't take any more and they leave because they're people who care most passionately about the work. And that's why I think that pay is also misunderstood. It seems to me that there are lots of false economies in this case. If you have a very high tuition rate, it costs employers a lot in terms of recruitment and training, going round and round and round. I've so met so many great employers <coughs> who find it really, really hard to do so. And that is a false economy. It's a false economy. I believe to have 15 minute visits. We're now talking about five minute visits. You know. I mean, again, I think we're just looking at this issue from the wrong way around. So, as someone who myself is generally very hawkish on public spending, rather like Gavin, who comes and spends a lot of time the tax, um, I actually think this is an area where we really do need to spend more money. Um, anyway, that's enough of me waffling on now that Norman has arrived. Um, have you got your breath back? Just about. And would you like a glass of water? I would. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think Norman's going to put up some slides, and what I hope you can get to, Norman, is it, a bit of um, 
a bit of clarity in this debate because it seems to me that a lot of the time we just ping pong back and forward between local authorities saying, well, you know, we're facing a terrible cut, which is absolutely true, we can't afford it. Employers and providers saying we've got way to pay margins and we can't afford it. And then you've got society out there which doesn't really value its workforce. So, you know, how are we going to spread that stuff? Um, so, I think I'm going to turn it over to your own Thank you very much, Camilla. Um, so the report we published today is the combination of a year-long research project over the course of which we've had input and advice from a number of people. I'd like to very briefly thank Unbound Philanthropy, without whose generous support this project wouldn't have been possible, and also thank uh, our co-author, uh, Dr. Shereen Hussain, um, who's from the Social Care Workforce Research Unit at King's College London. Uh, the Foundation's worked with Shereen over a number of years, and it's been great to collaborate with her more formally on this project and benefit from her expertise. So as you can imagine, having looked at this for over a year, uh, we've covered a huge range of stuff in our research, and I'm not going to try and mention all of that in this very brief presentation. What I'm going to focus on is giving you some of the key findings from our analysis of the costs and benefits of raising pay for adult social care workers. Now, what I mean when I say that is the people providing hands-on care to elderly and disabled adults, either in residential settings, in the community, or increasingly in their <coughs> homes. Now, we know that wages aren't the whole issue in terms of this workforce. Many people we've spoken to have cited uh, training, um, the nature of the way the work is organised, the contractual terms and the like. We also know that this workforce is not the whole issue when it comes to social care. There's raging debates at the moment around integration with health services, the way we commission care, and the, um, the nature of the overall funding supplement. So this is a bit of a disclaimer at the start to say I'm not going to deal with all those issues and concerns in this presentation, although they do feature in our report. But what I will say is that our focus on pay as a priority, we think, goes with the grain of these wider debates and concerns and can be informative to them. So to briefly explain how we came to focus on pay and the living wage in particular, uh, formal care services touch the lives of millions of Britons every year. It's a large workforce and it's growing, reflecting the rising care needs of our ageing population. It's set to grow further in coming years, again reflecting those rising needs. Uh, but there's been increasing focus on whether the sector is sufficiently equipped to deal with this rising demand. And in a sector characterised by low pay, wages have been a priority in that debate. That's driven calls for uh, um, the living wage in particular in a number of recent high-profile inquiries into the sector, which are featured on screen. But what we recognise is that while these calls for raising pay and care are gaining traction, specifically a call for the living wage as a target, there's been relatively little idea so far of what that would actually take in terms of what it would cost to pay the living wage and what benefits that would bring. Now, we were, we were concerned about the risk that we're going to get to a situation in which a lot of people are talking about the living wage as just a costless aspiration, and other people are saying it's too expensive and too difficult. So the key contribution of the report we've published today is a really robust assessment of what it would cost to pay the living wage, what benefits that would bring, in order to ground the debate in more realistic terms. And that's what I'm going to talk through. Very briefly on the case, I just wanted to highlight the fact that, as I'm sure most of you in the room know, um, pay is low in social care. Uh, typical pay in a frontline care job was £7.20 an hour last year. Um, it's moving closer to the minimum wage, reflecting the perfect storm of demand going up, funding getting squeezed. And as others have highlighted and we flagged in our interim briefing a couple of weeks ago, a significant minority of these care jobs were in fact paid below the minimum wage. Now, many would say we need to pay more in care just because it's the right thing to do, and we agree with that. But others we've spoken to have highlighted this combination of low and sometimes illegal pay with limited opportunities to move up the pay scale and um, very infrequent and basic training as hampering the ability of the workforce to deliver high quality care at all times. And others we've spoken to have made the link between pay and the very high labour turnover that the sector has. And they've, they've raised concerns about the sustainability of the sector um, to meet rising demand for workers in, current year, in coming years and meet out a proof challenge. So we think these three things, that it's the right thing to do, <coughs> concerns about quality, and the real recruitment challenge the sector's going to face with, with such an unattractive opportunity starters together bring 
a pretty compelling case to focus on raising pay. So, so how, how have we costed this? How have we done, how have we crunched the numbers? Well, it's a complex methodology with many stages bringing together a range of different sources, and I'm not going to go through it in detail here, but there is an awful lot of detail in the report for those interested. I will just mention our principal source, which is the National Minimum Data Set for Social Care, shared with us by Skills for Care, which is the, regarded as the leading source of um, workforce intelligence in England. We've extrapolated the findings from this to cover all frontline care jobs in the UK. So the costs I'm about to talk about cover the whole of the UK. Um, when I say frontline jobs, I mean I'm only talking about those jobs that involve the hands-on provision of care. Um, 1.4 million jobs in the UK, we estimate last year. And an assumed precondition of the numbers I'm about to go through is that we eradicated minimum wage non-compliance. We previously, um, in our interim publication, uh, estimated that there's currently a £140 million hole in labour costs as a result of non-compliance and we called on, um, we, we said that it was a responsibility of employees to fill that hole and called on government and local authorities um, to work on enforcement towards that. So our living wage modelling is on top of having eradicated non-compliance, uh, which is a necessary first step. So what would the living wage do for workers? Well, it would do something for a lot of workers because we estimate that just under a million frontline care jobs uh, are currently paid below the living wage or were last year. That's two thirds of all frontline jobs. And it would be a pretty significant pay rise, uh, just over £1,300 for the average frontline worker in terms of wage increases. Uh, but that's obviously not the whole cost. Um, raising wages brings additional costs, particularly in terms of employer national insurance contributions and pension contributions. And we've added those in as well to estimate the average increase in employer costs um, in each job when wages rise to the living wage. And that's just over £1,500. Uh, and obviously the pay rise, the, the pay rise of £1,300 isn't necessarily the direct impact on workers and their families we have to consider um, the tax and benefit system. So we've also estimated that after taxes rise and benefits are withdrawn, the average um, care worker, frontline care worker, would still be just under £800 better off um, were the living wage applied across the frontline care workforce universally. So um, the message of, of this slide has been a substantial impact across, raising across the workforce um, on Oh, so, so an impact that has breadth and depth, both in terms of the number of workers it affects and um, what it does to their, to, to their pay packets. So if that's the kind of per job, per worker picture, what does that mean in terms of costs across the care sector? Well, grossing um, the total employer costs per job up to all the jobs in the UK, we estimate that the living wage across care would have increased um, labour costs by £2.3 billion pounds last year. That's a lot of money. The next thing we've done, not just think about total costs, is we've looked at um, how many of, how much of these costs are associated with publicly funded care services. Now, kind of coming clean at this point, this reflects our belief that any overarching improvements to pay in care will require additional public funds. We see little headroom um, for improvements to pay to be made within the current funding envelope particularly given the very high share of turnover accounted for by labour costs in the care sector relative to other sectors. So splitting out the public costs from the total cost, that's the cost associated with publicly funded services, we estimate a gross public cost of £1.4 billion pounds, um, to pay the living wage last year. Still a very large amount of money. <coughs> A really crucial contribution of this research has been to make the point that were public money to be spent on raising wages in care, that wouldn't be a £1.4 billion sunk cost. There would be direct cashable savings uh, in terms of money returned to the exchequer as tax contributions from higher paid workers rise and as in-work benefits um, topping up the salaries of those workers are reduced. We estimate that those savings account for almost half of the gross public cost. 47% um, bringing our 1.4 billion down to a net cost of just over 0.7 billion. Uh, to highlight at this point as well that we, we've gone for a robust but very a fairly conservative approach in terms of what savings we net off in our central calculation, but our report does cover a range of other areas in which 
the public finances might say were public money used to raise wages and care. Um, I've, I've flashed a couple up on the screen, I won't talk about them in detail, uh, but this is, this is just to say that we brought 1.4 billion down to 0.7 billion and we think there's a case to say that that could come lower still when you consider um, the wider fiscal impacts of a of higher pay for such a large uh, low paid workforce. <coughs> Those, those costs, what we're talking about in the last financial year, 2013-14, uh, because that's the year we have data for. Uh, but a more relevant question might be how much is this going to cost uh, over the medium term? Um, and this, this slide highlights that um, our projections suggest that the cost of paying living wage income is going to rise over time. Now, there's a, couple of, there's a lot of things driving this, but the key ones are the fact that the workforce is set to grow, as I've mentioned previously, reflecting rising demand. In addition, um, looking at the methodology for the living wage, we, we expect it to rise quite quickly over, over the course of the next parliament. Nash, the outside London living wage is likely to be over £10 by 2020. So, in essence, we're chasing a moving target for a growing workforce. And therefore, our central forecast is, um, and this is in real terms, an increase of 75% in the net public cost of paying the living wage from last year up to the end of the next parliament. Um, the, the beautiful colourable rainbow is, um, I won't go into detail, but it shows that with, with different assumptions about what happens to pay and care, what happens to funding and care, and what happens to the minimum wage, there are risks that these costs could get higher still. So just to kind of, that's a sort of numbers to recap what we've, what we've seen. Um, the cost of paying the living wage across the care workforce is substantial. When we consider the part that, that falls on the public sector, it gets a bit smaller. And when we consider the direct cashable savings, the net cost gets smaller too. But even that is set to rise over time. So what, we should, what should we take from this and what should we do about it? Well, we don't underestimate the, the difficulty of calling for new resources in the current fiscal environment, um, especially new resources that are likely to, to, get, to get bigger as we go forward. Uh, but we do think that the savings we've identified are substantial and the wider savings of paying more in care to, um, if we can improve the quality of care, may be greater still. In addition, we highlight that even at the end of our forecast period, we're talking about 0.06% of GDP. Um, pales in comparison to some of the commitments that are being made in terms of health funding. So while we don't underestimate the difficulty, we think that there's a real strong case to make the progress and that we should be able to find the money if the intent is there. Although we don't um, identify where specifically we think the money should come from. So how might we get there? Well, <coughs> one option is for local authorities to redirect resources towards their care budgets, as some are already doing. Having, given that we've identified the cash flow savings mostly accruing to national government in terms of tax and benefit savings, that could be made far easier if some of those savings were passed down to local authorities who take action, with no worsening in the national fiscal position. But given the current landscape, we have to be realistic about how many local authorities can, can make that step. So another approach would be for national funding to care, for care to rise. Now, while it not, may not be feasible to do that tomorrow, what we've set out on this slide, just as an example, is how we could take stepped progress towards achieving a living wage in care um, by successively closing more of the gap between the minimum wage and the living wage over the course of the next parliament. So that would be a spending commitment of 250 million um, next year, rising in steps each year. A final point to make is that although I've highlighted how difficult the funding challenge is going to be, we don't think this is all about funding. There are many other practical and policy considerations if we are going to have a serious conversation about um, raising pay and care and just where we're going to get the money from. Um, we've set out a few directions in our report, um, but we, we know that there's a lot more that we'd like to see government, local authorities and providers work through. So one it is pretty much as a precursor to any conversation about funding increases, we need to solve this minimum wage issue um, in terms of better enforcement and more res responsibility taken by local authorities. If public funding were to rise to support living wage and care, we'd need to ensure that that reaches workers' pockets. And that, we think, means exploring how the living wage can be a condition or a criterion um, in procurement exercises. And 
I know I've been reading about some of the complications in terms of procurement law of doing that, but there's some interesting um, um, work to be done to explore how far we can push that and what can be done, even if it falls short of mandation. And a, and a final point is that um, one thing I haven't talked about much in this presentation, but it's covered a lot in our report, is that other improvements to um, care workforce conditions, such as better training, changes to contractual terms, a better employee <coughs> benefits package, for example, would be likely to maximise the beneficial impacts of raising pay in terms of actually achieving a step change in the quality of care and the continuity of the service delivered. So given that providers are likely to benefit from a higher paid workforce, they're, like, they're likely to have better retention, that's going to save them on recruitment costs, we think we need some sector level agreement on what they would do as a quid pro quo for more national funding towards wages. That might be progress on some of the things I've just mentioned around training and employee benefits. And if we can achieve that kind of agreement, achieve that quid pro quo, we think that that kind of progress will really solidify the impact on higher pay on quality across the health and um, across health and care and, and the wider savings um, higher pay might generate across those two sectors. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there. I think I've not done too badly on time, hopefully. Um, that's quite a lot of numbers, and I'm happy to take questions if there's a lot more in the report. Thank you. Thanks very much. Training of care workers 
has been incredibly uh, important and I'm enormously grateful to her for the work that she did. There are over 1.3 million care workers uh, and healthcare assistants in England. These people deserve high quality training to enable them to do uh, the job. Uh, the Camilla's uh, 2013 review found that training for these people was often very variable and inconsistent. Uh, and that's why we brought in the care certificate by way of the Care Act uh, last year. From April, all new social care support workers will be expected to obtain a care certificate within their first 12 weeks of employment. Its 15 standards include basic life support, privacy and dignity, safeguarding and duty of care, built on the best work uh, in the sector. And there is actually plenty of really good work. And it will give clear evidence to employers, to patients and users of services that the care support worker in front of them has been properly trained to a specific set of standards and knows how to act with compassion and respect. The CQC will be able to check whether a care organisation's employees have the care support. And just to be really clear, there will be consequences from organisations that don't uh, train their staff to this standard. Um, we've substantially toughened up the accountability of care organisations to ensure that the standards of care are at an acceptable level. Uh, where patients or service users uh, end up suffering harm or neglect, uh, and where new fundamental standards of care are breached, it will now, for the first time, be possible to prosecute the care providers, uh, and indeed the directors, uh, if they are culpable uh, in the care. So I think back to Winterbourne View, and when I ask the question, what can we do, what has happened to the company that uh, allowed that care to happen? And I was told, well, nothing has happened because we have to serve a notice first, and if they comply with the notice, there's nothing we can do. I, I felt that that had to change, and that there had to be much clearer accountability. Having a care certificate will empower <coughs> social care workers. It will prove to employers <coughs> that they're properly trained and adaptable, and it will uh, prove to families that they're able to give their loved ones thorough and personalised care. Let me also just pose this uh, question. If you're a youngster and you're looking at uh, possible careers and you're not well qualified leaving school and you look at the possibility of a minimum wage job in care or a minimum wage job in Tesco's, Tesco's job is a hell of a lot easier, less demanding, less challenging, less stressful. Uh, the temptation would be to go uh, and work uh, at the checkout till uh, in Tesco's. How do we attract people? Pay is one element of it and a critical element of it, which I will return to. But also the sense that you're entering a profession, that there is a career structure ahead of you. Uh, of course, management is one route, but should we not make it easier for those brilliant care workers who want to, to go on to train to become nurses? And should there actually be an intermediate level between the care certificate and the graduate level nurse qualification. Uh, I talked last week to Peter Carter, the Chief Executive of the Royal College of Nursing, and he argues actually for the return of the SEN, the Station Royal Nurse, or something equivalent. Uh, I think, uh, when I particularly look at the care sector in my own county of Norfolk, where there are large numbers of nursing vacancies, no one doing the job that is so important in those settings. Surely we need to look at whether there needs to be something in between uh, the care certificate and the fully qualified graduate uh, nurse, something uh, to think about. But we're also crucially, we also crucially need to focus on pay. And it's a disgrace, first of all, that many care workers receive less than the minimum legal wage. And it's a completely black and white issue, this underpayment of the national minimum wage is a criminal offence, it's illegal, uh, but it's also completely unacceptable and unethical for employers uh, to continue to do that. Uh, I'm not afraid to publicly name and shame organisations that do not pay their wages, their workers, the national minimum wage. When I was uh, a business minister for a glorious eight months uh, in 2012, uh, the Low uh, Pay Commission told me that it, under the scheme as it then stood for naming and shaming uh, organisations that didn't pay the national minimum wage, it was almost impossible to ever get to the point where you named anyone. I don't think anyone had been named at that point. 
uh, and yet there were areas where uh, uh, non-payment of the minimum wage was almost endemic. Uh, so I set about a process to make it much easier uh, to uh, name and shame employers that fail and refuse to pay the minimum wage. And last week the government uh, named companies uh, that had failed to do that. Uh, two of those organisations were care companies. This is part of a larger piece of work about getting the right pay conditions for our workers. HMRC has, over the last two years, investigated, invested, investigated 224 care organisations. It was shocking to find that just over half of these were paying less than the minimum wage. HMRC has ordered the repayment of £1.3 million pounds in arrears uh, to 6,550 workers with additional penalties issued to a total value of over £146,000. But we need to go further than this. We're working with BIS and with HMRC to provide additional guidance uh, to employers so that they understand the law, including tips about how uh, the common mistakes occur and the records that they need to keep, keep to prove that they are paying staff correctly. Naming and shaming is not an idle threat. A further, a further 94 organisations are currently under investigation by HMRC. And we're also encouraging care sector workers who have been underpaid to make the complaint, making sure they understand their entitlement to things like travel time. And I met recently with Unison uh, to discuss this. I encourage and support Unison in their work to get workers uh, who often may be very fearful of the consequences to come forward uh, and make the complaint. Right. We're making sure that there is no place for businesses to hide. All this work will be backed up by further targeted enforcement by HMRC, clamping down on businesses that break the law. I have made a formal request for HMRC to come back <coughs> to the care sector to do uh, targeted work, uh, and we've got approval for that and funding for that uh, from April of this year. Now, I know that you're dedicated uh, to getting uh, a living wage for employees and I too want to encourage commissioners and providers to deliver this and indeed to have that sort of national discussion about how we can make that the standard <coughs> rather than the exception. Local authorities also play a role in influencing workers' pay through their commissioning practice and partnerships with providers. Many local areas have made a decision to make sure that providers they commission pay at least the living wage, and it's a step in the right direction. And in a, in a way, one can ask the question, if some have been able to do that, why can't other local authorities in a similar situation uh, do the same thing? We are putting more pressure than ever before on local councils to commission wisely uh, and employers to do the right thing and pay their workers uh, fairly. Now, I've been uh, making the case uh, for uh, an independent uh, look at how uh, councils commission care and whether there is a link between uh, poor commissioning standards and poor care and poor treatment of workers. I've worked closely with David Pearson uh, on this. Uh, I wanted the Care Quality Commission to come in to look at perhaps 12 or 15 uh, councils, a mix of the bad and the good. Uh, to learn lessons about how to commission in the best possible way. We've done work incidentally with ABAS and the University of Birmingham uh, to set uh, uh, commissioning standards that are based on outcomes for the people that are cared for, rather than just paying on a time basis, which so often uh, results uh, in poor care. Unfortunately, there's a split uh, in the coalition. <coughs> uh, Eric Pickles simply will not sanction uh, the Care Quality Commission coming in to look at councils, even a sample of councils, to learn lessons about the link between uh, poor commissioning uh, and, when, and whether actually councils are complicit in law firm, because that is potentially what is happening uh, out there. I was at Bradford recently where they commissioned domiciliary care on a spot uh, purchasing basis. This is almost designed to ensure that corners will be cut uh, and that there is no focus on high standards in that locality, <coughs> in my view, has to change. Just another thought, though, that we need to uh, think about and need to work our way through. There is, at the same time as the sort of standard traditional uh, commissioning of care, the emergence of a 
burgeoning uh, uh, new approach uh, of personal budgets, something we've legislated for through the CARE Act. And I'm very strongly supportive of giving the power to the individual to determine what their priorities are and to determine who provides the care to them. But the personal assistants that are employed in those things are often uh, uh, employed in a way in a more informal approach than the traditional workforce commissioned by a local authority. These are commissioned in a way by individuals uh, and, and this presents new challenges uh, for us that we need to think through uh, as well. But to achieve great care, there is no doubt that we need a fairly paid, highly skilled workforce uh, and I certainly want nothing less for care workers and I know that that's your ambition too. I continue to try to make changes to help care workers get trained uh, and I will speak up for those rights to fair pay. But let me just end by, in a sense, addressing the challenge that Camilla put uh, in her introductory remarks. Camilla made the point that ultimately uh, it just looks like we need more resource here uh, to ensure high standards. Um, and if you think about it, none of the political parties as uh, currently stand uh, are even suggesting a ring fencing of social <coughs> government or a ring fencing of social care. Uh, the political focus is always on the NHS, it's the politically sexy thing. Uh, and it is critical, given the extraordinary existential challenge to uh, sustaining the NHS with an ageing population, remember the £30 billion pound funding gap by 2020 identified in Simon Stevens' forward view uh, before Christmas. It's essential that we have sufficient resource uh, in the NHS along with steps to uh, improve the way in which we use money. But we need to look at the care system as well. I fundamentally need to believe we need to bring the two together so that in every locality we have a health and care system uh, uh, commissioned uh, by a single commissioner, not two commissioners, uh, with a silo approach that we have at the moment. But I argue that the urgency uh, of this uh, is absolutely clear. This is not a funding gap in 2020, and David Pearson makes the point that the funding gap in social care is likely to be 4.8 billion, 4.3 billion by 2020. But this is a gap that just keeps growing here and now. So I argue for this year, as soon as we're through the election, the establishment of a non-partisan commission. I want all parties to come on board with this. Uh, and I want us to engage with the public in a national discussion about how we sustain the health and the care system, getting a focus on care as well as the NHS. Uh, and also uh, trying to engage with the public, as Camilla said, about how we ensure high standards of care. Uh, Camilla uh, made the point that the public doesn't always necessarily recognise the absolute importance uh, and the link between fair pay uh, and uh, high quality of care. So let's have a national discussion about how we sustain both the NHS and the care system and how we address the inadequacies of both the health and the care system. Thank you very much for doing channel the funding for social care through the Department for Communities and Local Government. It's designed to achieve a fragmented approach. Uh, we have to deal with Eric Pickles. Um, <laughs> it, is, it, it, it would surely be much better. I, I would say no more, but we would surely be much better if we had a coherent <coughs> department that dealt with both care and health. Many people argue it should be called the Department for Care and Health. Uh, putting upfront care as the thing that uh, has to be addressed first and foremost. But I, you know, that then matches my view that in a locality by 2018 we have to have a completely full budget. This doesn't in itself achieve great care, it doesn't in itself achieve the best possible use of resources, but I think it gives us the conditions with which we can perhaps uh, use money more effectively than we do now. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned um, 
your conversation with Peter Carter and your desire to see a, you know, a ladder, a clear ladder for people to climb up. Yeah. Um, one of the things my review recommends, which is is that there is a ladder. Yeah. And one of the problems is that, of course, Health Education England, which is doing a lot of very good work on this, again, social care isn't in the, isn't in the mix. So it's, it's absolutely classic. One of the things I wish to do is create one skilled workforce, which can, with a ladder, yeah. you know, somewhat inside. So you know, that, that, kind of, that kind of transformation is essential. The um, whole architecture of so much of what we do nationally is uh, to encourages the silo mentality, and we need to absolutely address that. Um, can we? Can I maybe take a couple of questions um, from people in the room and then throw them on at numbers? All right, I know you haven't got a huge amount of time. Um, Lady in the blue, have we got mics, or do you just want people to stand up? Yeah. Fine, you can just stand up and say who you are. Great. Uh, yeah. I'm Jessica, oh, sorry. I'm Jessica Watson. I work for My Home Life, which is an initiative housed at City University, promoting quality of life and gatherings for resident relatives and staff. Were you there last night? I was. Yeah. I was the one doing the tweeting running around. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just interested in what you had to say both last night and uh, this morning about the Eric Pickles block. Um, and whether <laughs> there's a bit more um, response from Labour about that independent look at uh, commissioning and the role that it has to play in, in good action. Okay, yeah. can we talk about yeah. that yeah. second? I will say, Eric is not here to answer for himself, so yeah. you'll never look at the maths. Um, how much we look back here is a bit of a problem. Um, lady here. Sounds better to describe Eric's first. I just wanted to ask the question of Norman and one of Laura, if that's okay. Um, isn't it Tommy out of zero hours contracts in social care? We don't really have a place in the social care sector, and they'll they frustrate all the progress you've been talking about this morning. Exactly. Look, can you said a bit more about the wider benefits you were talking about? You know, the impact on the local economy, the impact on the gender pay gap, and also the impact on families and carers, because if you can underpin informal care with good quality care workforce and services, then carers will be less likely to drop out of the labour market, they're less likely to have their own health and stress problems themselves. It's a massive impact on families, actually, if you can get the service delivery right. Anybody else? Well, 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 and I love doing care work, I love looking after elder people. But I wanted to ask how well would you keep me to, in this job which I love? Thank you. Do you want to take yeah. this? Thank you very much. So, Jessica, um, so, um, well, I, there is there's a philosophical difference here, um, and, uh, and I will leave, as Camilla rightly said, in opposing discipline here that Eric should be able to make his case. But my argument is that you don't achieve good care by only focusing attention on the providers. Uh, and in a way, you know, I think there has to be very clear accountability on providers uh, who fall below uh, acceptable standards. But they're often put into an impossible position. I, I think, you know, I met with a group of care providers in Bradford um, and when they have the only way that they can secure work for the local authority is by engaging with this spot purchasing. Um, it's, it's just a system that's designed to uh, end up with poor standards, and uh, and so the blame isn't entirely on the providers. Um, so if we're to have a balanced view of this, we have to surely look at the role that commissioning plays and to drive up standards. And commissioning, commissioning is a is a is a new professional in a way, it's, it's, it's still in its early stages, and there's a hell of a lot more we need to learn about how we can really use the power, the potential power of commissioning to drive up standards. If you incentivize the right behaviours uh, and, and focus on the results for patients, then I think you can achieve uh, really good results and better use of money, that's the critical thing, because if, whoever's in power over the next five years has this massive challenge about how we use money more effectively. Uh, and commissioning can play a role, but at the moment, it, too often it just doesn't. It's just passive, 
uh, and it, uh, it's based on buying, it's more of a procurement, it's just buying care uh, on, uh, you know, whoever gives the lowest quote for a quarter of an hour of time, and, and that is destined to result in poor care. Um, uh, so is that, is that okay? Uh, no, next. Uh, well, I, I struggle to really see any role for um, zero hours contracts in care. Um, there are parts of the economy where it suits both worker and uh, employer to have that arrangement. Many workers uh, quite want to have the flexibility. We're, we're, ex we're, we're legislating to end exclusivity uh, in zero hours contracts. These aggregatious contracts where we say we're not going to guarantee you any work, but you're not allowed to work for anyone else. Uh, that really is uh, outrageous. We're ending uh, that practice. But I can't see any uh, role for it at all um, in, in this sector. I just want, but, but when you ra raised your question, I just, it just uh, a thought came to me. In, in my county of Norfolk, there's a GP practice in deepest rural Norfolk um, that has set up a social enterprise uh, to provide uh, domiciliary care for a very rural, sparsely populated uh, population. Um, so no profit is made from this organisation. It's all ploughed back into the uh, in, into the uh, care that they're providing. Uh, it's grown very rapidly, um, and workers who start off on quite low pay, but if they are reliable and, and provide good care, their pay goes up, uh, and they end up being paid a good wage. Of course, the interesting thing is, and uh, Camilla would make this point in our introduction. You stop the bracket turnover of staff, people become committed to stay in the organisation. I, I, I'm a great fan of sort of the mutual concept where workers in an enterprise have a stake in that enterprise, and I think it's perfect for this sort of uh, work. And you know, if you can give people a stake, if you plough the money, the profits that's made into the organisation, into providing great care, then I think you can achieve continuity. Uh, you can achieve high standards of care and you treat people properly. <coughs> I better. Have got time for one more. Nina, have I got time for one more? No. Uh, okay. I looked quite aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> Passive aggressive. Right? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Some studies have, have sort of proved inconclusive on this. But we bring together a lot of increasing evidence that higher pay can drive quality. Now, one element of that is job satisfaction, which is increasingly essential to delivering high quality, compassionate care. But I think a really important part is the thing Norma just mentioned about the rapid turnover of staff. Um, we, we show some evidence in our report around, around the links between pay and staff retention. There's a massive debate at the moment around continuity in care, and obviously. Um, both increasing retention and reducing staff absence. There also seems to be a link between pain, sickness, absence, and things like that. It's going to be massively important to continuity for families. Uh, you mentioned families, I think. If, if a more stable, more satisfied workforce can deliver services with better continuity, that's the ultimate outcome. That, that's what makes a difference to families and to care recipients. Um, another thing we touch on in our report is the economic benefit. If you don't have prime age adults, taking time out of work when the care of their elderly relatives um, is, is patchy or inadequate. There's an academic research showing the lost kind of economic potential when those people are engaged in informal care rather than market activities at their full value. And the other thing we highlight is um, the wider savings across the health and care budgets. If, you can keep, if, if good quality care can become more preventative and keep people out of residential settings and in their homes for longer. So obviously that's really difficult to capture, but there are some kind of around the edges of the system when you think about things like unnecessary mm -hmm. AE admissions and bed blocking when people need to be discharged. So essentially we can keep them out um, in the first place and when they go in we can get them out faster at the other end. And there's increasing evidence showing the kind of the economic savings of a more joined up system 
where people flow flow from help and care and back again better. That's just a claim, but it's more important. Thank you. Now I'm going to move on to our other two panelists. Um, David Pearson is president of the as many of you know. Um, David, do you want to just reflect a bit on some of those issues? And yes, maybe I talk about the six questions. Yeah, and maybe also address this question of whether the living wage can be on the standard of care, which is what we're going to do. Okay, so uh, good morning everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services rep represents 152 directors of adult social care in England, the senior staff next directors. But actually our charitable purpose is to further the interests of those who need social care service, service regardless of their status or background, and promote standards of care. So I think I'm exactly in the right place. And I think as if we care is a really good time. Because actually, I'm not diffident at all about the responsibility of us as a nation in the fifth richest country in the world to all people who have disabilities or who are becoming older and needing care. Because I think it is an indictment of us all. <coughs> as president of ADAS, I met with the HMRC a few weeks ago to work out how we were going to enforce the minimum wage. Uh, legislation in this country. That should not be something that has to happen. And therefore, I would say to you, if you do believe in this agenda, then we need to make sure that every politician as we go to meet up to general election absolutely thinks that social care is a priority for spending in the next round. It is 2% of public expenditure. And the fact that the health service has the, that sexier uh, component as normal and describes it that uh, does not be like, can be lied and the size of it, when you put the two together, it can make it all seem like a huge problem. Social care is distinctive because the people who provide care, in my experience, are largely hugely committed, despite the um, attractions of, of Tesco's or um, the supermarket, to the care and support of the people that they work with. And I never ceased, as a director of 10 years, 36 years in social care, I never ceased to be humbled by their contribution to the people that they serve. So we need to do some hard thinking in, in this country, and there is some good news, because we have got the Care Act, and Norman led that wonderfully well, because it's a piece of legislation that everybody uh, that I come across supports, because it has the right principles of personalisation, uh, of, of making sure that the services are integrated and actually the consideration of people's well-being, not just making sure that they stay alive, but the quality of their life is such that people can be thinking that they are living well with whatever concerns they have. And the other thing about social care that's important is that the complaint lament about health and social care currently is that it's fragmented, episodic, and impersonal, thinking about the interpressions issues. But when social care is working well, it's joined up continuous and personalised. And that's why 80% of people who receive personal budgets, who the uh, 4,000 people surveyed by Manchester University, reported that the personal budget and social care improved the dignity in their support and made a difference to their outcomes. So there's some fantastic news out there. There's a wonderful opportunity to build on that in the context of health and care integration. But integration itself does not actually solve the financial issues we face because, as Simon Stephen says, joining up two leaky buckets does not make a watertight one. And if we think about social care, the problem is of, the, of not paying a sufficient amount and, and having not good enough terms and conditions that there's a 25% turnover of care staff in this country, which is not a very good basis for care. So what's, what are the issues? Well, I think that in terms of the bad news, there's been 3.5 3 billion, 26% reduction um, in social care budgets over the last four years. So if you think about losing a, a quarter of your income as needs are rising, and it was the National Audit Office who said, resources are falling, needs are rising, and there is unmet need. So we already have an issue. We're not only are we talking about the pay of the workforce, we're talking about having enough money to meet the expanding needs of the nation with a doubling of the over 85s over the next two decades and some good academic research which predicts that 
and there'll be an extra 25 for some learning disabilities, we will need social care by 2026. So as Norman rightly pointed out, we think in ADAS, and we've done some fairly robust work with the LGA, Local Government Association, that the 4.3 billion gap in social care funding between now and 2020, to go with 3.5 billion that have already uh, gone. And I don't think this is sustainable. I've just looked at the national figures for the procurement rates of local, local forests are paying externally from the Health and Social Care Information Centre, and they have not gone up in four years at all. Except for direct payments, they've, they've gone up. But everything else has stayed the same or slightly down. That is, that is not sustainable, and it is a consequence of local authorities needing to spend 90% of their budgets on direct care, as I do in Nottinghamshire, and having a quarter of less resources. So this is not this is not possible. On the issue of, of uh, local authority commissioning, we have launched, with the standards that Norman mentioned, some reviews carried out by, by peer review. And in fact, I put my hand up for this for the pilot, and there are three pilots going on as we speak. I'm not sure any 10 people from a review team arriving in my authority as I'm speaking to you. So we will be publishing the accounts of that, um, and we are doing a, a transparent job in terms of making sure that we look at local authority commissioning um, uh, uh, as part of our sector led improvement approach. The Care Act says, says the following. Uh, in the statutory guidance. When commissioning services, local authorities should assure themselves and that have evidence that service providers deliver service through staff remunerated so as to retain an effective workforce. It must be at least sufficient to comply with the national, with the national minimum wage. So that we must assure ourselves and allow for the service <coughs> providers to meet statutory obligations and to make sure that there is the appropriate level of training and development for staff. So we will be actually issuing guidance um, <coughs> in the next two weeks for local forests about how to fulfil that responsibility. So returning to the issues today, clearly it is self-evident that we want to make sure that we move towards a workforce that has greater clarity of esteem with the health service. And, and in doing so, we must improve the terms and conditions of the workforce. The 4.3 billion that I cited, which is needed to deliver services over the next four years, does not include the analysis from this. So there's another 1.4 million, million or 700 million that would need to be added to the 4.3 billion. But I remind you that it is still, we are still only talking about 2% of public expenditure. It is not a question austerity, this is a question of priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I'd like to move straight on to Heather and then we'll open it up after that. Um, Heather Wakefield is head of the Labour Government Research Group at Unison, um, representing over 700,000 of those who have received the grant for the Labour Thank you, Camilla. Um, I'd really like to start off by welcoming um, the Resolution Foundation's report. And so Shireen's work that I'm very familiar with as an ex member of the Low Pay Commission as well. And also to welcome some of the um, progress that has been made, particularly um, in enforcement and uh, guidance and so on, that Norman Lamb has, has piloted. Um, as Unison, home care and adult social care in general has been uh, very dear to our hearts for some time. And uh, a couple of years ago now, based on some research we did, that I th I'd like to think actually really threw um, this issue into relief about low pay and particularly zero hours contracts, we launched our ethical care charter, um, which links very much the living wage and good conditions of training with quality care. Our simple argument is recognised here that you can't have one um, without the other. And our mission is to get local authorities and social care providers to adopt the charter. Um, so far, we've got, um, I think it's uh, eight local authorities and two external providers who have 
who have picked up the show. So there's some interesting results, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, but I wanted to take just a slightly different tack and say that I think the situation we're in is the product of three key things. First of all, um, critically underfunding which everyone has recognised. But secondly, I would place a lot more emphasis on the outsourcing, privatisation and fragmentation of social care in driving down paying conditions and quality. But thirdly, and this is something that I think is very important, and Laura talked about wider social policy issues, um, the fact that the vast majority of the workforce are women and the whole issue of undervaluing of women's work within our society and care work in particular and allied to that the absolute weakness and ineffectiveness of our equality legislation be it, be it equal pay be it sex mention and race and the fact that it can't easily be applied to a predominantly female workforce to help bring pay up um, this funding crisis um, and the, the situation we face isn't um, new. In the uh, 1990s at Unison, we were tracking social services in the spectrum of inspections of home care. And what we found very frequently was uh, high quality care, but the um, inspector going in and saying, you're paying your workforce far too much. You've got to cut paying conditions. Part of the drive that began before the coalition government to cut funding of <coughs> social care. And um, that allied with the big push to create a market and to privatise, um, along with spot purchasing and so on that Norman has mentioned, really began a very conscious driving down of paying conditions in adult social care. And, and we shouldn't overlook that. Um, as everyone's mentioned, uh, we have a situation where local authority budgets by the end of this parliament will have been cut by at least 40%. Um, adult social care, on average, amounts to about 35% of local authority budgets, but it's becoming a large proportion as other things are cut. And the LGA has said that 60% of councils will have to cut drastically another service next year just to provide the additional care that's going to be required. So we simply cannot dodge the fact that um, although there may be issues in commissioning and so on which I'll come on to, uh, the money isn't there. And I think David's point about this being we being the fifth or sixth, you know, there's argument about it, richest economy in the world and not being able to afford uh, decent, high-quality care for our elderly vulnerable is a uh, moot point. Um, I just want to say something about the creation of the market and the outsourcing of social care. Um, in the 1980s, we worked very hard uh, within uh, what was then the new thing, one of the and predecessors, to make sure that the Equal Pay Act was enforced in local government. We had job, a job evaluation scheme that ensured that for the first time home care workers were paid the same as refuse collectors and refuse drivers, because before that they weren't. So we created the job evaluation scheme. Every local authority had to review their pay structures, and lo and behold, home care pay went up. Of course, they should be paid the same as refuse collectors and drivers. Then along came the market and privatisation spot purchasing and so on and immediately we have this um, pushing down pay conditions to the level of the minimum wage or lower. Um, now in my view if we have an effective equal pay or sex discrimination or combination act which we don't at the moment that situation could occur. We couldn't have a situation in which women's pay was equalised to fellow workers and then see it driven down by a privatisation process. And that is what happened. And I would argue that the creation of the market, and in some councils you have more than 100 home care providers. Um, we did a Freedom of Information Act that showed there are at least eight councils with 100 providers. This not only um, creates a sort of chaos, but if you think about it, you've then got 
um, workers crossing local authorities in all directions in a very irrational, unplanned fashion. Um, and of course, uh, would cost an awful lot in, in travel time if they were paid, which many of them um, aren't. Um, what we know is that at the moment 93% of councils, and this is based on some more work we recently did recently, don't um, ensure that providers pay for travel time and they don't enforce uh, the minimum wage, let alone the living wage. So while I don't blame councils who have very little money and are being squeezed for having to uh, cut costs, um, I, it's absolutely unacceptable that commissioning should be done on that basis. And we know also that councils, from the same as what we did recently, that councils are not tracking paying conditions um, within the providers once the work is outsourced. So that really needs to be looked at, and the commissioning guidance probably is strengthened. Um, but what we do know is that um, among some councils who have adopted the Houston Ethical Care Charter, um, they have actually managed to save money despite increasing pays for living wage. So, um, for instance, um, Islington and Southwark are both reviewing outsourced contracts as they come up, uh, looking to bring them in house. Um, Lancashire looking what well, has reduced drastically since so adopting our charter the number of providers it has and they're finding that having a, a smaller number of providers with much more uh, flexibility but internal control if you like uh, they can reduce the amount of travel time and afford to pay workers a living wage um, so actually paying a living wage can uh, and have benefits on the organisation of um, the service. Um, I just want to make one final point, um, and this is please in no way to undermine the case for the living wage for care workers. I'm 120% committed to it. But I do have to make the point that um, half a million directly employed local government workers are not paid the living wage. And last year, the bottom rate of pay in local government, the directly employed staff, was about to dip below the new national minimum wage. And we had to push the employers to put out a circular to local authorities to flag up to them that pay for their own work because was about to dip below the national minimum wage. And they had to do something immediately about it so as not to pay foul of the national minimum wage legislation. So, um, this is not um, simply a problem for the care workforce, this is also a problem for playground assistants, teaching assistants in some cases, schools <coughs> workers, other directly employed local authority staff, and is a function of the downward pressure, public sector pay restraint, as well as, as cuts in local authority budgets. And it would be very difficult to create a situation where outsourced, uh, local authority outsourced staff were paid the living wage and the directly employed staff weren't. Um, so this has to be set um, in a, a wider context of, of public sector pay too. Thank you very much. Um, hi, um, my name is Helen Kersey, I'm from the UK Commission for Employment and Skills, and I'm not, obviously not a provider. Um, first of all, can I just tell, I think there's a bit of a shame that we can have an answer to this lady's question, and I don't know if somebody else will come and yes. take Sorry. the question. Um, but moving on very quickly, because I've got a couple of comments and a question. So, I just want to say, I completely <coughs> agree with David's point, that this isn't a matter of austerity, it's a matter of priority. And I think what, what we're getting at here is the undervaluation of women's work and what we consider as a society to be productive work. Because I think there's a bit of a sense in which, you know, caring for the elderly and the people with 
burn out spells and so on, isn't really productive, it just absorbs resources. And I think it's entirely wrong. And as a result of that, I think perhaps, and I'm interested in Laura's view, on the kind of further work that we need to do around the multiplier effect of paying people better wages, the money that goes into the local economy, and the way in which we are just free riding, actually. It's a big economic problem, because we're free riding a big part of the female workforce. And then my question, in addition to that, is, you know, we've talked about the public finances, but I just wonder about the impact. I mean, I'm, again, as Heather said, you know, I'm 100% behind the living wage, but I'm interested similarly to the childcare issue. What about private households that have to pay the bill? And that will then have an impact, I think, on the public finances, where people start to struggle to afford the higher cost. And I just wonder if there's a view on the private bill as well as the public bill. Do you want to come back from Maybe Laura first, because yeah. that's a sort of challenge to Yeah, yeah um, two quite specific questions. So on the that kind of undervaluation of the work and um, of caring work in general, uh, we we do discuss this. There's, there's really good studies showing that if you compare caring jobs that are helping and caring to jobs that are otherwise similar attributes, they are there is a significant pay gap and one of the points we try and make really clearly in the report is that before we start talking about quality and integration of health and social care and meeting the recruitment challenge and all the really economic arguments, we need we need to kind of consider how we value care work as a first priority. And I think the points you raised about um, the gender of the workforce really tie into that in terms of the gender pay gap. In terms of the private costs, you're absolutely right by splitting out public and private costs, the implication is that self-funded costs need to rise. We made that really clearly in our report. We actually we're at, we actually provide a, a, a fairer split than what's going on at the moment in that when costs go up, you've probably heard about the self-funded premium, the fact that local authority fees are being held down mean that self-funded costs are going up uh, faster and cross subsidising. So we don't rely on any cross subsidy to to meet this living wage challenge, but we we do in splitting out public and private costs acknowledge that we're going to raise pay that does have implications for some kind of cost. And that's something as a society we, we need to think really seriously about in terms of, and obviously the provisions being brought in by the CARE Act um, provide some kind of protections around that, but it's it's a serious challenge of our work to, 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 in terms of how we make it there. And that, that just needs to be out of um, I mean, just on the, on the women thing, um, what we know is that um, home care workers do an awful lot of unpaid overtime. Um, and I think that our whole care system is funded on the underpaid and unpaid good women of women. Um, and there is absolutely no question about that. And uh, no one will get away with this with refuse drivers or refuse collectors. Um, you know, immediately there would uh, there would be something done about it. Um, I would argue it's a much more important job. Um, and um, Manchester Business School have done some interesting research looking at why women do care work. Um, and the main reason uh, women do care work, unsurprisingly, is because they want to make a difference. And I think this comes back to is it Evelyn, you miss your, your um, question earlier. And I mean, it's tempting to say, you don't know why you stay in care work, but obviously everyone wants you to because you yourself say you want to make a difference. And that's why you do it. And you enjoy it. It is immensely fulfilling work, I think, if you don't have to grapple with poverty pay, if you're well supported, and if you get adequate training, which many, many home care workers don't. Yeah, just quickly, I, I, I absolutely agree with Heather's response to, to the question about why to say you know, work, but I'm very pleased to do it. Um, the, the, the point I wanted to make was that in relation to the contribution to the wider economy, um, there is of, often this view, isn't there, that actually anything in the public sector is a drain on the economy of the country, and everything that's in the private sector actually generates the, the wealth that we spend. Actually, that's not quite true, is it? And the skills for care did some work which showed that the contribution to the um, economy was 43 billion, um, which of course, compared with the state investment of just under 14, is a pretty great return. Great, right, thank you. Um, can I take a couple more? Um, I'll get to take over there and Jennifer Ross is. 
Uh, Colin Angel, the United Kingdom Home Care Association, so probably the provider um, voice that you asked for. Uh, and, and I know there isn't a provider voice um, from the stage this morning. Um, I, I think we can be. Um, I would like to start by thanking the Resolution Foundation for the work that they've done, and um, it's been a pleasure to assist with, with, with this project. But I think we need to really understand the, the economics of the current funding of social care. Um, and uh, in a shameless plug, I'm going to mention UKHCA's minimum price for home care, £15.74 per hour. Um, without breaking an embargo on a report that I'm releasing tomorrow, uh, I'm going to publish the um, prices paid by local authorities um, across the UK for older people's home care. Uh, and we'll see just how many authorities meet our minimum price for home care. Um, now, that minimum price was not a wishing exercise on how much I'd like care, worker, care providers to be paid. It was factored on flat rate national minimum wage. Um, I commend that, that work to you. If you want to understand how much home care costs, we've broken that down, um, that down for you. Um, in addition, I absolutely, who would argue that the living wage is not the right minimum target for the social care workforce? But we have to back that up with a reality, with a reality check for local authority commissions. Can I just ask you, Colin, that's very helpful, um, what you think of Heather's comments about privatisation and fragmentation? I mean, are there areas where there are actually too many employers <coughs> pushing up costs? Um, uh, I can't say for um, any individual market whether 100 providers is a, an appropriate figure or not. I think what we probably could do much better with as a sector is to stop the amount of travel time that home care workers are experiencing by uncoordinated commissioning. Um, and one of the good examples of that is actually zoning local authority areas um, to keep travel time down and make the best use of the limited money that we have. Right, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, I'm Rhys Director of the Living Wage Foundation. Thanks, Echo, everybody, thanks for this report. Hugely valuable contribution to the, uh, to the campaign. Um, we, the Living Wage Campaign as a whole has made some good progress in the last couple of years, um, but the care sector is the one that is holding out, and um, we have about a dozen care providers who are accredited in wage employers. None of them really contracting primarily with the public uh, sector. 30 councils across the country are accredited living wage employers, that means they're, they're directly employed staff to living wage and, and are at some point in implementing it in their procurement. But again, social care is a huge challenge. I would hold up Islington and, and, and Southwark as really good examples where that progress has been made. We launched a special campaign focused on the care sector called I Care About Care. We're really trying to avoid some of that ping ponging of blame that you mentioned, uh, Camilla. So it's bringing together workers like Eunice and uh, providers and commissioners to first of all identify that this is a societal problem and then try and engage in a way that I think we've struggled to engage more widely previously. There's clearly a role for the national government here, and it's a shame that the Minister has, has, has left. Um, and there's a specific proposal that's part of our campaign and it's in, in the Resolution Foundation report, which is around this idea of a reinvestment. So treasury, treasury benefits when employers are paid living wage, because tax credits reduce them and tax take goes up. One proposal is that some of that saving is then reinvested into the sector. Right. Interested in your thoughts about that and whether there's there are other there's another role for, for the national government. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jonathan Jones, I'm representing the Health and Care Protection Council. So as you know, we're the regulation of social workers in England. And my question for the panel really was what role do they think regulation of the social care workforce more broadly uh, might, might have to play in this issue? Our council, as you may also know, have recommended to government that social care should be brought into statutory regulation via a kind of suitability scheme, meaning social care workers would need to meet national nationally recognised standards and actions could be taken against those who didn't, who didn't you know, weren't supposed to work in the profession. Obviously that's about public protection, but they're obviously also really just discrete and you know, tangible benefits to regulation, uh, not least increased professionalism and potentially 
um, you know, driving up standards and increased status for the profession and how that might um, come to bear on the issues we're discussing today. Thank you very much. Um, Laura, were there any points you wanted to pick on? Uh, no, just that, just that our research is really important and that we um, reinvest in savings with the reason so I needed to create my presentation for me. We say that those local authorities that are taking action will find it a lot easier. Some of those savings were brought down from national government to local government. So yeah, hopefully some of the evidence we presented provides um, an opportunity to have a more realistic conversation about how that will work. So can I ask you, I mean, <coughs> on to well, on all three points, yeah. right? it's quite interesting. And also, yeah. I, I realise that I'm not sure I fully understood when you got to the HMRC, actually, on those points you can Okay, well, I'll just say that first. So, HMRC are providing some frequent ask questions, questions for some guidance, which we're going to translate to guidance for people, is about how to assure ourselves that the minimum wage is being paid uh, in all its uh, elements. And we're obviously going to discuss that process with the providers, big such as Colin before we send it out to make sure that it's got as much support as possible. Um, I just so on the on the I just want to say something about privatisation um, because Heather is right that that the disjunction between resources and needs uh, has been going on for quite some time. And in fact, if you saw the BBC report a few weeks ago on the Capital Country calculation, you'll see that expenditure per head on older people went up by forty percent in ten years <coughs> as it went down by twenty percent in social care. So there's always been, for directors like myself, a combination of trying to distract the public purse. And one of the ways of doing that is being able to outsource. There's, been, there's no question about that, and that was expected. I think the other thing to say is, though, that the introduction of direct payments is a crucial um, element of this as well. So the government in, in, uh, made, made it compulsory for people to offer direct payments. That came out of the disability movement, and direct payments cannot be spent on in-house services. So there's 24% of those uh, fund the community care in, in, this, in this country. Um, so so there, there are those elements to it. And actually, we have to be careful because direct payments are things that people actually like, those people who, where they've worked on, because the evidence shows it. On the issue of um, the, the good examples, I think my point is that, the, that clearly there are good examples like my history. But if you look at the overall pattern of expenditure, you either have to pay, you're, you're, you're faced with the difficult choice of how much you pay for the staff and how much you translate that into uh, the commission contracts and indeed providers paying their staff, and how many people you serve coming through the door. And so we still go back to my fundamental question, which is what does it take to fund a, a, a fit for purpose 21st century care service that, that absolutely meets the aspirations of the care act. And my, my, my strong point to you is, is that, that it's not what we're currently getting, and, it, and we think you know, it's going to get worse if we don't do something. Um, on the health and care professions, um, to be perfectly honest, it will be further down my list of priorities. Because if you're thinking about how you're going to pay the next bill, what you wouldn't do is invest a whole bunch more money in, in regulating the workforce who's poorly paid, poorly trained, and where, where actually commissions haven't got enough money to provide enough services, or are concerned about you know, money to provide services for the people. And it's gone down by like half a million over the last few years. So I'm afraid you come after money, um, after accredited training, which I am, also, because I think there's a fantastic job of national health here, but I would like to take it further. And, uh, and I think the, the regulation of the workforce would come from last. So what you do is, what you do is, what you do you go and find something that actually isn't satisfactory. Um, I want to make a controversial dinosaur yeah. trade union point, which is, that, <laughs> which is that actually I think there is almost no evidence to suggest that the outsourcing of social care has improved quality. And I think large amounts of public money are wasted in the procurement commissioning process 
on uh, the profit margins, which are sometimes 10% or more, and sometimes on very, very um, high salaries for a large number of executives. Um, well, I'd just like more for comment. I think one of the things that's really engaged me today is the fact that the language that's been used by the Resolution Foundation and indeed by others is kind of bringing this thing into the 21st century. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm talking about um, a recruitment challenge you put in as Laura and putting some real rigorous numbers around it and talking about productive work, to the point the lady down here made. I think that's so essential. We need to start talking about this in more sort of Chunky economic terms, I think that's something that's very positive. Um, there's obviously a long way to go, but it's been great to go. Thank you all very much for your coming.